Welcome to uh, Georgetown Downtown. And this is the first of the 2015 Spring Speaker Series that we're hosting, uh, that the Urban and Regional Planning Program is hosting. Uh, we're delighted that you can make it uh, on short notice. This is itself uh, an example of uh, crowdsourcing. Um, we uh, are really excited to kick this off. And this, this, the theme of this spring is called The City Disrupted. So for some of you who attended events in the fall, uh, the theme of the fall was planning large investments in large cities, so long-term projects implemented over many decades. Uh, and this spring, we're kind of turning uh, around and focusing on smaller, quick changes in cities. Uh, and it's a whole kaleidoscope of, of issues that we'll, we'll uh, explore. Uh, we're going to start tonight with transportation, but we're going to explore the lodging industry. Uh, we're going to explore the sports industry, uh, emergency and disaster management in cities, and we're going to end <clears throat> uh, with a really interesting candid conversation about governance uh, and explore how uh, changes in Detroit have happened uh, on a very short-term basis with long-term implications. Um, and so take a look at the, uh, at, the, at the program for the whole spring. We hope that uh, you'll come and join us for many of the, of the sessions. Um, this process uh, is remarkably laborious uh, to assemble these, and I just want to thank uh, Jamie Kralovec, who's, who's here, uh, Lynn Ely, uh, Leila Sadawi, Bill Bailey, Dave Curry, and so many other collaborators that are working uh, to help make these speaker series possible. <clears throat> And I wanted to just quickly reflect on, you know, why we're even doing this. Uh, the, um, as, as many people know, and many people in the audience are students, uh, we have incredible conversations that happen within the classroom. Uh, but this really is an opportunity to both um, assemble as a program, uh, but also assemble with representatives from across the university, and indeed from across the community here in Washington, uh, to reflect on major challenges that are facing cities, uh, many challenges facing the profession of city planning, and, uh, and have an open conversation and a candid conversation about uh, things that are happening in real time, uh, dialogues that are occupying many people's um, attention. So uh, we're going to kick it off today with, uh, uh, with a panel called Frictionless Mobility killer apps coming to get me. Uh, and the premise of this is really to explore what really is happening in transportation planning. How is this incredible onslaught of digital communications and mobility services changing the way people think about how they get around cities? And we have an incredible all-star uh, all -star panel. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Sam Zimbabwe, who's going to make a presentation to get us going. Sam is the Associate Director for DC Policy, Planning, and Sustainability at the District Department of Transportation. Sam's the director and, and uh, was the lead author of a milestone plan called Move DC, which was just uh, debuted a few months ago. Uh, and. Um, he is the former executive director of a national nonprofit called the Center for Transit-Oriented Development. He holds a Master of City Planning degree from Cal Berkeley, and he's going to lead tonight with, with a presentation to get us going. <clears throat> Following that, uh, we're going to assemble um, a, a panel discussion with Ellen Jones, who's the Director of Infrastructure and Sustainability at the Downtown DC Business Improvement District. Uh, Ellen has, for many years, been uh, an outspoken transportation advocate. Um, she was the executive director of the Washington Area Bicycle Association, and before that served uh, at the Federal Highways Administration. Ellen uh, holds a Master of Public Administration from the University of Austin. Uh, we're delighted uh, to have Gabe Klein here with us today. He's the senior venture partner at uh, uh, Fontanales, is that the correct? Fontanales Partners. <clears throat> uh, Gabe has an incredible um, 
uh, set of, of public service experience, <clears throat> experiences. Uh, he was the director of transportation here in the city uh, under Mayor Fenty. And um, if that's not enough, uh, he, he, he picked up and, and moved to Chicago and was the director of transportation in Chicago under uh, Mayor Emanuel. He uh, has a history of entrepreneurial activity. Uh, he, for years uh, before public service, uh, served as the Washington, D.C. director of Zipcar um, and is the founder of, of a company called On the Fly. <clears throat> and Gabe has a degree in marketing management from Virginia Tech. And uh, we're very excited uh, to have Shai Palavani uh, here with us. Shai is the founder and CEO of LiveSafe, uh, an organization that provides uh, mobility services. Uh, not just any mobility services, these are the mobility services that um, uh, have been developed in part with Georgetown University, and he'll tell us uh, all about that. Uh, Shai also is a, a proven entrepreneur. He's created several other business entities, and he holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Management from James Madison University. Um, we're so excited to kick this off. This is a slightly different format than we had in the fall, where we had a single speaker talking for a very long time about individual projects. I think this time around, uh, we've assembled additional speakers to really engage with each other and to engage with you. And so with that, I'd love to uh, uh, welcome Sam up here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not supposed to talk for a very long time, is that? OK, I will try to keep it short. But uh, what's, what's very exciting, and I'm very excited to be here, uh, it, you know, so Uva said, as, as I'm usually the associate director for the Policy Planning and Sustainability Administration at DDOT, which is a very bureaucratic thing. Uh, but tonight, Uva said that my title is Chief Provocateur. So uh, what, what I say here may or may not be my bureaucratic position during my day job. You can see where, where, my, where the fault lines may be between my bureaucracy and my provo provocation. Uh, so a couple things that I'm going to talk about, and I will talk very quickly about, I'm going to talk about self-fulfilling prophecies, about how we make transportation decisions, and then about how we think about that in the context of planning for the future of DC transportation. Um, and let me th start by saying that the, the profession of transportation planning doesn't have a ton to be proud of in the legacy of what we have done to cities. So uh, this guy holding the big scissors is flanked by Miss Concrete and Miss Blacktop there with the sashes. So that's what we thought we were getting. This was the future, was building all that. And this is what we got with that. So we got a lot of people stuck in traffic. We got a lot of really great pedestrian conditions next to the drive through on, on these nice streets. Um, we got connected, great connected sidewalks for everybody. And then we get these. You know, we have bike facilities. This is often what bike facilities are in most parts of the country, where you get, you get a whole lot of real estate for cyclists in a very welcoming environment. Um, so why did we get that? Um, so traditional transportation plans. How many people know about the four-step modeling process that transportation planning, besides Lou there, Calvin, a couple people. So what it does is it takes land use and it f says how much how much are we going to get from this and where is it going to come from and who's going to choose to ride in what different modes uh, and then what streets are we going to put all those mostly cars onto and there's a lot of errors in any of these so we think it's a very precise field we say we know exactly how many trips this housing unit is going to going to generate and they're going to come exactly this direction and we put it all together and we sort of uh, we end up with this number and a, a letter grade for an intersection, and we try to mitigate that by making the intersection bigger uh, to solve it. And, and what, a lot of that is actually based on some flawed, flawed uh, inputs that go into the whole thing, and then that gives us flawed outputs. So this was uh, work that the State Smart Transportation Camp Initiative did a, f uh, a few years ago now, I think. They've kept on updating it. Um, but this is where, this is what, FHWA projected would happen with VMT in the country um, every year over the course of several years. So you can see that 
And the black line is what has actually happened over the course of those same years with, with VMT. So we started off projecting a line out from today about VMT growth. We'd, we started to see it slow down, but the slope of the line that we were projecting never changed. And so we're always projecting more traffic when we actually haven't seen that. Uh, and, and we know that cities are very different than that, and we in the district have, ha are very different. This is our mode share for district residents over the past 25 years or so. Um, and you can see that we actually this year, or last year, 2013, uh, eclipsed the percentage of district residents are commuting on transit than are commuting in a car. And we're up to 4.5% bike mode share, 13.5% uh, of people walk to their job in DC. This is not really captured in those four-step models very effectively. And if it is, it's a fudge factor that we, we, uh, you know, we apply to get some of the answers that we like to see. Um, and we know that this success is partly built on the investment. So it's not necessarily driven by demand. It wasn't driven by demand at the outset. Now it largely is. But when we started building uh, bike lanes in the city, we had a very low number of people who were biking. We started to build facilities, and we saw the number grow. Uh, so there's a, there's a positive feedback loop that's not necessarily borne out by the projections that we've given if we just take what the projections are, are given. But DC is a little bit different. So if you look at how DC residents commute, uh, which is you know, what I showed before, and you look at how the region's residents commute here in the whole metropolitan Washington region, we still have a largely auto-dominated region, even as people who are coming to and working in and living in DC are getting around very different. And some of that's about what we've chosen to build within the district versus what we've chosen to build outside of the district, and about how land use really feeds into the, the future of transportation as well. So let me talk briefly about uh, so that, that was about the models and about what sort of um, transportation projections have, have told us about the future of, of transportation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about engagement and how we think about what uh, citizen involvement in the transportation planning process uh, is and, and how that's changed over time. So in the 60s, we had a lot of plans based on that Miss Blacktop and Miss Asphalt uh, or Miss Concrete mindset that we were going to build freeways and we were going to solve all of the future of DC's problems by building freeways that would have cut through neighborhoods uh, and, and, and you know, destroyed the communities that we now value so much. Citizen action shifted those things, shifted investment from, from freeways to start metro rail, uh, shifted the, the, the tenor of what transportation was in the district, and that carried us for a long, a long time. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever seen this. I think I've, I've actually used it in Ellen McCarthy's class last year. So if you did, if you were there, then you saw this already. But uh, I, I really like the ladder of citizen participation. So the 60s planning era, when we started to have involvement in the transportation planning uh, arena, it wasn't just plans bestowed on citizens. It, sit, uh, Citizen participation was largely about therapy or manipulation at the very bottom of this, the, the rungs of this ladder. Then we've got to informing, consultation, maybe placation. I don't know if anybody has seen the Tumblr planners pointing. I, I featured in it. That's why I like to show this. That, that's me, and I'm not even pointing. That's what the caption says, sadly defined by an absence of pointing. And then we have to figure out how we get to this higher level of, of involvement in uh, the transportation planning arena without losing some of what happens at the regional or the, the larger scale. So it can't only be about what people want on their street. It has to be about how that fits into the context of a system that moves a lot of people. So um, I, I, I think about the latter, but I also think about a couple things, especially as we move into a, uh, as we are in this era of killer apps or whatever, right, killer apps. Um, there's a, a scale of public versus private, and there's a scale of static versus interactive on the engagement side. So traditionally, we've done public meetings, which are very static, and they're very public. You, you know, one of you will stand up and say, I want to grandstand for a while and tell you about my idea and sort of derail the whole meeting, maybe, or, or um, provide valuable input, which I will then take back and respond to. Um, but when we started to do Move DC, we wanted to, to blanket this spectrum with a lot of different ways of getting people to engage in the process. So, Lot, people people invo get involved in different ways. Some people 
choose to be involved through social media alone and can't make it to a meeting or don't want to come there. Um, some people are really private about their ideas, but they're no less valuable than the people who want to stand up at a big public meeting and, and tell everybody about their idea. Uh, and then some people, we thought that there was actually some some uh, value to having just some abstract research, not even about specific things, but just trying to get some attitudes towards transportation, which would be entirely anonymous. Um, and then, and then we, th we still thought that there was value in, in a broad public engagement process uh, that, that was sort of more traditional in the way we did it. So we did things like this. We had this draft vision. We brought it around to four different workshops across the city. We let people write. So this was very, this was somewhat private. People could, you know, I, nobody was going to, nobody had to read out their comments in public, uh, but it was very interactive. Somebody could cross out somebody else's comments and write their own uh, in here. Um, and, and we looked for, we constantly looked for ways to, to do our involvement in a, in a multitude of different ways that um, got information that we wanted, but also let people give us, give us their venting information when they needed to. And we ended up, as Uva said, with a plan that is very aspirational and, and tries to be forward-looking. We were looking out 25 years um, and, and tried to think about what the future of, of transportation in the district would be with a couple hundred thousand more people, a couple hundred thousand more jobs, uh, and, and goals around sustainability that tried to push, the, um, push things towards uh, alternative or m making alternative modes not alternative, but uh, sort of the mainstream. Uh, and, and our goals really ended up being about more than just transportation. So there are some transportation things in there. We've got some transport, you know, transportation planner words, but a lot of it was about safety, about uh, economic development, about the vitality of public spaces and things like that. And throughout this process of thinking about what the future of, of transportation in the district were, there were a couple of key themes, some of which came really directly from the public. And we, 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 we use those different ways of in involving people to get to um, some really common uh, themes about travel choices and about the reliability of, of systems. People didn't really care about uh, congestion so much. They didn't talk about that when we asked them what they wanted. People wanted to have reliability. So as long as you knew how long it was going to take you, uh, there was a little bit more um, willingness to, to wait, maybe. Uh, and then people wanted choices. We at, at DDOT, we really value safety and the efficiency of our vest investments, so we brought those themes. We also heard that from, from the general public, but that's not the, those weren't necessarily the first things that people came, uh, came to us uh, and, and said. And so we, we sort of, um, the, the, the ultimate framework that, that guides the plan is that every street needs to do something besides just moving cars. Um, we talked about prioritizing pedestrians, we talked about accommodating vehicles, and then we talked about doing something else and using our streets to do other things um, that b beyond just uh, moving cars. And then we took that same, those same outcomes and we put them into our old tools just to see how we were doing uh, in, in various ways. And so um, we looked at the number of trips, so how many, how many cars are going to be driving around, how many people are going to be driving in different ways. And we, we basically said, we're going to keep, well, we didn't say this, but, but our, the, the analysis of what we ended up with as a plan ended up with about the same number of car trips in the district over the course of a day as we have now. So in 25 years, with a couple hundred thousand more people, a couple hundred thousand more jobs, we'd have the same number of car trips overall and massively expand the number of transit and bike trips and walking trips that we have um, in, in the district. And that means a lot of investment to be able to accommodate, accommodate that level of demand. And it means reallocating roadway space to be able to, to, be able to do that safely uh, and efficiently. Um, and then we, we looked at how this starts to, to uh, provide options. So how many people will have uh, access to good bike facilities? How many people will have a very close walk to high capacity transit? And we map that. So this is, the, this is those conditions today. Uh, the red has fewer choices. The green has more choices. And then if we make this series of investments, which is a lot of commitments, a lot of, uh, a lot of different types of investments, we can flip that and make a lot of people have very good choices uh, for how they get around the district. Um, and so, I, so I, I really think that the, these outcomes that we got to in, in Move DC were partly 
because of the way that we, we got to, we, we, did our, we did our engagement, uh, the way that we left behind some of our traditional transportation planning tools but still used them, um, and, and we got to a plan that if we can achieve it, uh, we'll, we'll really, I think, build a city that can move people into the next, into the next century even, towards the middle of, of this century, but I think it'll, it'll set us on the course for the future uh, beyond that. So a couple of provocations beyond what I've just talked about. So um, can we avoid overcorrecting? So we've gone, you know, that, that state smart transportation initiative slide, we, we were projected, we, we've vastly over projected the amount of driving that people want to do and that's led to transportation decisions which fulfill that, that prophecy. But can we avoid overcorrecting? So how do we sort of not swing too far to the other side and say nobody's ever going to drive ever again? Or should we? Um, how do we think about, uh, I, I've got concerns about equity and how many people have access to different types of, of getting around and how do we think about that from a policy perspective. So uh, when, we were, when we were looking in, in Move DC about how, how to provide choices to people, how do we make sure that those are not just available but actually accessible to people. And then with citizen power, as we get to those very high levels of the ladder, how do we, who, who ultimately gets to hold the power? So who gets to choose what happens on a street? Uh, how do we make sure that that results in optim out outcomes that are good for society as a whole and not just for people uh, who are lucky or, or skilled enough to wield that citizen power in a local environment? Uh, so I kept it pretty brief and provoked, hopefully, a good discussion. You hear it? Great. Um, so thanks so much, Sam. That's fantastic. Let's start with the other panelists now. Just spend a few minutes just reflecting. What, do, what are you doing these days? What, 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 how are you engaging in this? You all have incredible backgrounds. But just share with us um, what you're doing and, and provide a little bit more of a personal, personal background on, on um, your engagement in transportation. Ellen? Great. I should have sat in another chair. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, the Downtown Business Improvement District where I work, um, we are actively partnering with the District Department of Transportation, SAM's agency, to try to bring technology to uh, bear on trying to have a more efficient movement of people, goods, and services in the downtown. And while maybe people in Move DC didn't talk about congestion, and that's what they said they really wanted was reliability, well, congestion's the main reason they don't have reliability. So how can we bring technology in to help us with, with that congestion problem? Uh, taking lessons from uh, a project, maybe some of you all know about SF Park in San Francisco. They brought uh, uh, technology to bear on the whole issue of parking availability and, the, and how you manipulate the price of parking to create more turnover so that you do have more availability for curbside parking, metered parking. And uh, taking lessons from that, DDOT's getting ready to do a pilot here in Chinatown, actually. I think you all might even be within the study area. I'm not sure. Maybe uh, H, H Street is. is a, and so trying to use sensors, video cameras, and other such technology to figure out, okay, where are the highest demand areas for parking and how can we tweak the price uh, of parking to move parking out to areas where there's underutilization and get more turnover where there's a lot of demand. And so that, it seems as though that pilot is, is on its way to happening and we're very, very excited about that. Um, so that's one of the things that, that we're working on currently, currently with DDOT. Um, and then I just had some other thoughts about things that we've worked on perhaps most recently. The whole issue of how we've become more efficient in bicycling through bike share, which Gabe was a big part of at DDOT. Uh, you know, 
sharing bicycles with large number of people and car sharing with large numbers of people only happened because of technology. Uh, but the idea had been there for a very long time. You know, there are hundreds if not thousands of bicycles that got abandoned and thrown in canals all over Europe uh, before they figured out how you could overcome the tragedy of the commons where people kept putting out bicycles in public spaces and they kept getting trashed because nobody owned them and nobody cared about them. Uh, but you know, with technology we overcame that. Uh, similarly, people have been sharing cars and families and communities forever, but with technology we can now do it with thousands of people. So, you know, that bike share, car share, those are all part of, of the technology uh, applications in downtown that make it a place with an awful lot of mobility options. I think I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you. Gabe? Oh, I thought you were going to go, but you are. I just went. Oh, he just went. All right. Can you guys hear me? Is this on? Um, so I left government a little over a year ago, and um, uh, re-entered the private sector, sort of. I became a fellow at the Urban Land Institute, uh, which you know well, and um, um, I, I sort of, uh, I definitely have ADD, and then on top of that, I'm a bit schizophrenic, not in a clinical way, but I like to do a lot of different things, and so um, I told myself I was going to take three months off after five years of government and try to kick back, and um, promptly jumped into about five different ventures but it's very interesting. I got to put together a joint venture, you know, when Bike Share was on the rocks for a while. And the, not that you guys know about this, but the company that makes a lot of the Bike Share systems um, went bankrupt. And so I set up a joint venture with a company in Montreal to work with a company in France and to produce actually the Bike Share system that's in Seattle last winter and um, worked on the sale of that company to somebody else. And then um, took on a bunch of startups in around March or April. And I've been working with I guess five different startups. Um, most of them are DC based. There's some great companies in DC in the technology mobility space, uh, like Transit Screen, um, which is not an app actually. Uh, could be an app if they wanted to be, but they aren't. Uh, Ride Scout actually, which we sold to Daimler, um, and various other companies. And um, I could bore you with all the other things I've been working on, but I probably shouldn't. But I mean, like. I'm working on flexible mass transit, which is fun. I'm working, I'm on the board of NACTO, which is the North American City Transportation Officials, which is the city version of AASHTO, which you guys have probably also never heard of. But it's important because they set policy, um, or can set policy, uh, for how cities want to plan in the future, uh, react to change, technological change. And so there's two of us on the board, myself and Jeanette Sadekhan. It's a strategic advisory board. And I've been focusing a lot on autonomous car technology because I think it'll be the biggest change to hit cities in this century and, and maybe ever uh, in, in transportation. Um, it's really autonomous um, in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technologies, uh, and it's not just for cars. Uh, it'll affect buses. We already have autonomous train systems around the world. Um, we probably need that in D.C., actually. Um, so I've been working on that with NACTO and Google uh, and some of the car companies as well. So that's been really fascinating. That's a fun topic to talk about. Um, and I started to write a little book, actually, um, which uh, I have to turn it in a month and I'm way behind on. And, and I had a baby. So not me personally. That, that would be uh, really amazing. But um, I have a nine-month-old. So I've been keeping really, really busy. But the... In the technology space, I mean, everything's changing so fast, and you know, the importance of the things that I'm working on, or I hope uh, the importance of, is that cities can really embrace the change and affect a really positive change by working with the private sector. And this is what I'm writing about too, because you know, I've known Ellen for a very long time, and she's seen me struggle with Zipcar and with my food truck company, and you know, without the uh, downtown bid, for instance, you know, I never would have made inroads with some of these businesses. And um, once you become big enough, then all of a sudden the government's like, oh, wow, this business is really having an impact. And then they, you know, want to embrace it and they often don't know how. You know, Uber came along and they really sort of um, divided and conquered all the cities. It was a brilliant strategy. And um, if the cities had come together through an organization like NACTO and said, this is what we want. We want equity. We want you to have cars in southeast and northeast and northwest, or 
we want cars in Oakland and the Bay, you know, but they didn't. And so we got, we all got Ubered. Um, but we also got Ubered because the government moves way too slow. And when I was in government, you know, my focus was like on get it done. Like SF Park is brilliant. And we actually had, so we launched an entirely new meter system here in about 12 months, uh, Terry Bellamy and I and, and, and some other folks. So when you go out now, you can pay by phone, which is an app. It talks to the um, meters, which are new, and they're very low cost, and they take credit cards, and they're solar powered. We did a bunch of pilots to make that happen very quickly and let the public tell us what worked and what didn't work. Um, we had probably eight different companies come in and, and pilot all their stuff. The government doesn't usually do that. They go out and they do a big RFP, and then they go out and they give the money to the lowest cost provider or best value. And we would have chosen, I can tell you if we did that, we would have chosen a meter that nobody could figure out how to work because that was our leading meter. And I was out in the rain one day on U Street, I remember it vividly, and there were seven people in line, pouring rain, could not figure out how to use this meter because it was so over-engineered and they hadn't done any usability testing with the public. So by doing all these pilots with sensors, with, pay, with different pay-by-phone systems, I could tell you a funny story if I had time about that, and all these different meter configurations, very quickly, we made a much better financial choice for the district, which incorporated a lot of technology, which meant that the district made about 60% more money on its parking, which enables us to do things like the yield management system for parking, which by the way we should have done four years ago, that was our plan, but government moves so damn slow. And so when I was in government, my focus was trying to do things at about four times the normal speed. Uh, <coughs> So I'm the founder of a, a, a startup, uh, uh, an app. If you guys have an iPhone or Android, I'd love for you to download it. It's called uh, Live Safe, one word. It's a free app. Um, if anything, I'll get some downloads out of this. Yeah. Um, and uh, we really have had good success in the last year because we focused on usability testing and, and focus groups. And we really focus our business on universities. Um, we're based in Roslyn. Um, I lived in Capitol Hill, been held up at gunpoint, and the entrepreneur in me said, why not create a mobile app inspired by being able to pay for your meter through an app? Why not be able to report a crime or share information through an app? Um, and every week we meet with Georgetown University students to give us feedback on our app. And the, the most important thing, a school, worst thing a school could do is launch an app that nobody uses. So creating engaging features was very important to us. Uh, chief of Police at uh, Georgetown University, Chief Gruber, very innovative police chief. Uh, we listened to him on feedback and we've built an even more impressive solution within uh, the dispatch center in the public safety office. And really the app is just a great communication app. Um, it's a language our generation speaks. Um, and then through Chief Gruber, we've really innovated on transportation piece. So part of the app has a map. So we can put public transportation on the map and show you where the buses are as they're running. Um, so we really focus on GPS. Uh, uh, and then uh, there's a new feature that we just launched three weeks ago, which is called Safe Ride. Uh, students can, kind of like Uber, request a safe ride uh, that students have volunteered uh, to drive these vans around and pick up students late at night and, and take them to their destination. Um, but all this within the last year, um, and, and you guys have been great, your sexual assault specialist, Mira, uh, who's now moved on and works at Harvard, she was very instrumental in creating a path and communications uh, around that. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, last year this time we were just in a handful of schools in Virginia. Uh, now we're servicing about 80% of students in Virginia and, and DC. Georgetown's using it, UDC. Uh, we got big schools like Virginia Tech, West Virginia, uh, USC, ASU. They're all using the product. Um, and again, starting with universities, we're able to learn how to build engaging features. And then we're creating this uniform product in other markets. So now we have the Detroit Pistons using us and the Atlanta Hawks at their basketball games. Uh, San Francisco 49ers have launched it uh, with all their people who come into an arena. And again, you can see transportation, you can request rides, you can communicate with safety and facilities. Um, uh, uh, Andrews Air Force Base, where the President and Congressman fly out of, most secure base in the country, they're leveraging the technology. Uh, we're in conversations with the Navy and others 
Um, so it's pretty exciting, but again, it's very important. So you got to build products and get feedback. So I love doing stuff like this where, you know, you come up, you talk about your ideas, hear feedback, have a dialogue. That's really, really important to building stuff that's useful and people will do. Um, we luckily raised six and a half million dollars from uh, Barry Diller and IEC. It's an internet conglomerate. They, they own Chemistry.com, Expedia, Ticketmaster. They only invest in technologies that are transformational, and they really believe kids our age, I mean, we don't even call our parents. We're not going to pick up the phone and call 911. But if you can text and you can communicate, it's just incredible the kinds of stuff uh, that students and communities start sharing. Um, and, and that's what's really led to our success. And, uh, you know, please download it. Please use it. It's a free app. Uh, and we, again, we focus on schools, but we're getting into communities, military bases, and arenas. It just makes sense, a communication app. Uh, but then wrapping it under this umbrella of transportation, that's really what got the engagement. Because most people don't interact with an emergency, or, uh, but people will go out there and check for the bus routes. And uh, I'm not going out to the bus stop till the bus is there. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. It fits under the safety umbrella and really has created, you know, we're the most used safety app that exists and our most used feature is SafeRide. That, that's our most used capability. So um, I want to start with a couple of questions and we'll open it up to the audience. And I, I want to kind of just continue where, where you've left off. You've talked about kind of iterative learning, listening, uh, collaborating. And uh, Sam introduced this idea of overcorrecting, of maybe doing too much of something um, as, as compensation for maybe what hadn't happened before. So the kind of question is, you know, is this truly, you know, disruptive and, and you mentioned the word transformative, uh, or, or is this really just serving people's needs better, you know, and, and, and kind of listening better than we were able to before and, and more kind of organically thinking about how people have wanted to live in cities all this time. So is it disruptive or are we just doing a better job listening to, to how people want to live in cities? Well, Go ahead, Gabe. I can jump in on that. I mean, I think when you look at Sam's slides, you know, you see the product of the Industrial Revolution basically through the last century. and. This century is all about the cloud revolution or, or the internet uh, uh, revolution. And as Ellen said, you know, the technologies are changing. It's not just um, the apps, it's the apps interacting with the things, you know, or some people call it the internet of things. So it's the meters talking to the app or the app talking to the people and the cars. Um, and so I think, or, or with bike share, you know, it's, it's solar technology. It's modular technology and the re-engineering of the bike. But it's really like, like when you look at the bike share bike, when we went and sourced that, I mean, it is like, you know, it's 55 pounds. It's like an old Dutch bike. It's just much smoother looking, but that's basically what it is. It's a three-speed Dutch bike. So, you know, a lot of the technology is very, very old, meets very, very cutting edge and new to enable people to actually have a simpler life. So we think that people need to have really complex lives and I think where we're headed with all this technology is an environment where we actually do a lot less. Um, people will work less, you know, and it's a whole other conversation, but, you know, I, I tell people, make as much money as you can in the next 10 years, because there's probably not a lot of jobs after that. Um, uh, and, and I'm sort of kidding, but it is going to be a big thing, um, because we're going to become so efficient, and we're going to hang out in our neighborhoods, and I grow my own food now. I'm getting solar panels on my house and I'd like to get off the grid and probably work from home, you know, and you'll be able to use, uh, um, uh, what's that technology that they have? You can put it over your head. Uh, tinfoil. No, not tinfoil. There's um, a VR technology, virtual reality meets uh, holographic technology, which is actually going to change the way we travel. I mean, for, for business travel, for instance, right? So instead of traveling to have a meeting in San Francisco, I'll probably have a meeting, it'll be just like this, but I'll be a holographic image, which so will change the whole airline industry. Disruptive. Totally are, disruptive. Yes, yes. But it, it, you have to look at it for what it is. It's like, you know, we've changed so much in the last hundred years, but we were basically, you know, sitting around campfires not too long ago, you know, not making hot dogs, making turkey wings. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, things are changing quickly, but I, I actually don't think the technology is that amazing yet. Interesting. Other thoughts? Well, I mean, it, it, there's disruptive at, at the level that we're only going to see a hologram next time we invite Gabe to a panel. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, I'll be <laughs> <laughs> and 
and then there's just, to me, I mean, when I think about, I'm sorry, I'm really obsessed with the Chinatown parking project. I am so excited about it. So, Sam, make it happen. Uh, I mean, we literally are disrupting, physically disrupting the phenomena that occurs where people store their cars at the curb all day by slugging the meters. Mm -hmm. And we are physically disrupting that now by changing the price. By, by changing the whole market value of that piece of real estate. And that is disruptive on a very smaller scale than holographic conference calls. But, so I think, yes, I think they're at, at different levels, it, in different applications, it is disruptive. And then sometimes it just is, it facilitates what we were going to do anyway, and we, as Gabe says, it's more efficient. So I think it's both, not one or the other. I think it's a little bit of both. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is remarkable about what technology enables right now is that in the past, you would leave people, or, or, or in, you know, suburban Omaha, you leave your house in the morning, and you get in your car, and you drive to your destination, and then you get to your office, and you drive home, or you, you know, every, once you leave the house and get in your car, it's your car for the full day, and that's the way you're going to get around. And as soon as we get people to leave their houses and have choices about how they get around, then we've broken that 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 bond, and and it's 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 not uh, it's not reasonable for for somebody us to think that everybody's going to bike every trip that they take or everybody's going to walk every trip that they take. But we now provide the opportunity for multiple ways for people to get around, and and I think that makes. Uh, it's challenging because it's very difficult to predict then how people will use those choices that, that they have and how do we make the infrastructure and the space available for people to, to make those choices and make them safely or, you know, choose things that are good for everybody. Uh, so, you know, the, the things like the Chinatown uh, pilot, you know, we're going to have to see how that interacts with car to go which doesn't, somebody who's driving car to go doesn't care if it's $5 an hour at the meter because they're not paying, you know, the company is paying, but they're not, or sort of, they're not paying for that cost. So there, and there's always going to be some people who aren't sort of paying for the cost of what they do or aren't, you know, uh, not, not bearing the societal cost. Yeah. It's not the, <laughs> they could pay at some point in the future, too. We can talk about that. <coughs> um, all right, so let's move on. I'm going to combine the two second uh, questions. On the one hand, we are always worried about leaving people out or being mindful of people who've never even known how to get in uh, because of whatever barriers. Um, and then conversely, uh, especially with the ride sharing apps, there's this incredible feeling of, of, of access, of being able to just hit an app and, and, and have someone you know, some entity, maybe driverless, maybe may, maybe a, there's a driver, uh, come pick us up. Um, and uh, and so talk about that balance and how in your work you're, you're dealing with, you know, the social equity and access issues on the one hand and just um, really unprecedented levels of freedom and access on, on, on the other. I think it definitely how, how does it play out, you know, in terms of I mean, it, it creates disruption, which is amazing. Um, it, again, uh, me putting my safety hat on um, a solution for safety in a lot of places is good transportation. So a college student, I'm at a party, I'm in a bad situation. Sometimes after that bad situation, calling 911 doesn't feel right. I'm not going to call my parents. Um, it's trying to get a ride to get out of there. Um, so within our app, one of the pieces that are the most customizable is this uh, ride option because every school is different. Every school has a different program and every student has different options. So when you get to that screen, we're giving them limitless options. They can choose safe ride. They can choose Lyft, they can choose Uber, they can call a cab that's in their city. And we want to provide all those options and make it easy for that student to, again, use our app as a gateway to get to one of those quick access buttons. And again, that's disrupting how, you know, making it easier for someone to, to, to get out of there. Um, so, you know, it, it's a benefit to college students. Um, so, yeah, on the equity issue, it's complex, obviously. Um, I think that you, the government, as I, said with the Uber example, the government has a lot more control sometimes than they realize if they embrace things instead of run from them. And so I would love to see what I try to do is embrace the change and then make sure it applies to as many people as possible. Make the private sector do that. And when I was with Zipcar, 
we were doing deals with cities, including DC and Metro. And, you know, I remember my CEO was like, oh no, we're gonna have to put cars in Southeast DC, you know, so basically write, write that off every month. And I was like, I don't know about that. I mean, I was a little nervous, but I, I'm like, everybody needs transportation. We put the cars there uh, at Suitland Metro and, you know, all, uh, uh, and Costume Metro. And um, within like 90 days, they were the busiest cars in the fleet. Um, not only that, we had a lot of requests for better cars. Like, I don't want a, you know, a, a Beetle. Like, can you give me something with some utility, like, like an SUV, and then it would be nice on a Friday night to have a BMW. And so um, it really uh, showed that our preconceived notions about what people need and what they want are often wrong. Um, so that's one thing. And, and it, you know, it's very interesting when you ask people, well, you know, what are the issues? Well, you know, we don't know if, if poor people have uh, smartphones, right? And actually, if you look at the data, particularly like here in DC, what it tells you is the penetration of smartphones is pretty high throughout all neighborhoods. It's just that older people don't have them. It could be a you know, rich, lily white neighborhood, or it could be an African American neighborhood, or a Latino neighborhood. Old people don't have smartphones. So we don't usually call a spade a spade and really address the real issues. And then the other thing is competition means lower price. Like we want to preserve the bus, the local bus for people, right? Because it's guaranteed access. But for a lot of people, it's a really crappy quality of service. And it takes them, you know, an hour and 15 minutes to get to work and two transfers because the bus only runs every hour. But by golly, we're going to keep that bus running. When the reality is a private sector service that could crowdsource a free shuttle for people out of that neighborhood may be a lot better quality service that ran every 15 minutes or Bridge, which is a company that I work with, which is a flexible mass transit system. And so we have to be careful in government not to get too caught up in our fiefdoms and our power structures and our unions and all of these things that lead us to think we're providing equitable service. And sometimes we really are, but not in every use case. And in some cases, it's not good enough. And actually, if you embrace the private sector, they can come with a much better lower cost solution. So I'd just like to jump on to what Gabe was saying about bus service. And this is not wearing my downtown bid hat. This is just me being a resident of DC. I, I just want to underscore yep. that I think, as you called it, crappy, inefficient mass transit bus in this city, inefficient bus service in the name of equity is the biggest fraud that is happening uh, yeah. to the taxpayers. It is not equitable to give people bad bus service and to not be completely dedicated to creating the most efficient bus transit service is to shirk the responsibility. And then also I think we need to think about, you know, maybe equity in addition to being efficient service, you know, equity issues should probably be handled somewhere other than in a fare box. And so we should be looking at, you know, and through, I mean, we have this large percentage of our population in DC, I'm gonna stop in just a minute, that are, you know, highly dependent on social services provided by the city. We should be looking at transportation as a social services cost center yeah. and deal with it in an integrated way rather than saying we're going to have all these different price ranges and we're going to give you bad service. <laughs> e equitably crappy. Right? Equitably crappy, so, yeah. So I, I would, I'll just, uh, I think both, both Gabe and Alan have touched on, uh, I, I, don't, I mean, so when we launched car to go three years ago now here, we had some of the same worries about equity and making sure people had access and they, we had things in their permit that they had to have them in, in all eight wards and a certain number. And we've actually seen really high usage in out, outlying parts of the district, sometimes substituting for transit trips, but really crappy transit trips. So, you know, like rather than taking two transfers and a bus to a train, people are, you know, at late at night getting safely from one place to another and quickly because they don't have to wait. You know, rather than an hour, it takes them 10 minutes. Um, and it's sort of, we see a lot more off-peak use. Uh, and I, 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 well, I don't know, I agree with, I agree with everything everybody else has said. I'll shut up now. One last thing. That's not too disruptive. So when I was there, you know, we expanded the circulator bus. Some of it was under us. Some of it was council members that wanted it expanded. And, you know, when you go to the council hearings, you, you hear comments like, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. The circulator bus attracts different types of people to it, you know. And there were these sort of veiled uh, comments. And some of it was like where the bus ran. And some of it was that it was a much nicer bus 
Some was, there was, a, it was a buck and it was always a buck and you knew where it went, right? Because it said so on the side. Um, and it came every 10 minutes, right? So Muriel Bowser, Councilmember Bowser, now Mayor Bowser, started asking, you know, why do only certain neighborhoods have this circulator bus? Why not all neighborhoods? And, you know, she was planting a seed for the future there. It was, she, she knew exactly what she was doing because we had negotiated, um, Scott Kubli uh, really undertook this. He negotiated a, a new contract and rebid it. So we were pay paying $83 an hour for the bus, fully loaded with everything, including the bus, versus Metro was 128 at the time, plus the capital cost of the bus. So you're talking about 160 probably? So we're half the price, right? So what Muriel was saying was, why are we paying Metro 160 an hour? We can run our own bus that's way better and run it across the river and run it to Northeast and everywhere for half the price. So, but to do that, we had to partner with the private sector to let them run the bus. Same union, by the way, but that is, that's where things get dicey. But if you don't make that change, then that quote unquote equity is not really equity. Actually, I remember one other thing I did want to say is I think that when you think about the bus and you think about how to sort of make good transit available to people cheaply, you, you run into this citizen power issue of making change to anybody's established uh, way of life. So like the E4 is a tremendously unproductive route that Metro is always trying to eliminate in, in outer northwest. Ellen's neighborhood, <laughs> and when we, whenever Metro puts this on the table, or DDOT sort of supports putting it on the table as, uh, <laughs> no, Ellen doesn't because she knows what she's doing, but other people do, and, and it's like the, the 30 people who ride that bus every day, right. like all of a sudden come out and say, don't change our way of life mm -hmm. and you're going to ruin everything for everybody, and that's a really difficult frame in which to make great, efficient decisions mm -hmm. because you ultimately have to come to this public hearing where only the people who are going to say no come out and, mm -hmm. and put the politicians under pressure to not do things that they would otherwise do. Great. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Let, let's go to a question up here and then if other people have questions, let me know. Hey, guys. I'm a plant. No. Um, my question is, uh, I mean, you can look at a city as just an aggregate of neighborhoods. And we've talked a lot about the private sector really on the technology side in terms of their role of disruptive mobility related te technology. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the other sort of major private sector player in neighborhoods, the real estate development community, and what you think their roles should be? That's a great question. Who, That's a great who question. wants to start there? The bid doesn't want to start off oh, there. Sure. <laughs> Actually, we have our economic development director sitting right back there. I'd much rather put him on the spot. But I, I would just say that my experience, in, and when I went to work for the downtown bid a long time ago, uh, all my black advocate world said, oh, you're going to the dark side. You're going to go work with developers. And um, I've actually found our development community to be incredibly progressive, nearly always more progressive than the neighborhoods they're trying to work in. <laughs> and, you know, Lou, your company has, has worked a lot in the development community. That's a big part of the practice of, of the company that I think that you created. And I, I just think we have a very, very progressive uh, environment here where, you know, they want to build less parking in their residential structures. Right. You know, they want to locate near transit uh, and, in, and, and do maximum density near transit. You know, they, they get it. <laughs> it's, it's those citizen power people that have thwarted far, far too many really excellent development ideas, especially in our neighborhoods. And I, I, would, I would agree with that. I think one, there's, there's a little bit of a tension sometimes with uh, real estate development, and, and that comes when, especially on the transit side, when we expect that transit will be somewhat productive and that it's not just a social service, that uh, we often get transit service dragged to places that are seeing real estate investment without, with, but not yet to the critical mass of being um, 
able to be served productively by transit. So we sort of, there's sometimes a tension in that of, you know, uh, Buzzard Point has cheap land, and so we can entitle a whole bunch of development that's going to happen uh, not right next to the metro station, but is, or the southwest waterfront, or something like that. Millions of square feet of development that costs a lot to invest in, but then costs a lot to serve with, with transit. Maybe, and it, it's very difficult to time those things correctly, and some of that's government being slow to respond, some of that's uh, the, the nature of large infrastructure projects and timing them with large real estate projects, but I feel like we're often out of step a little bit and that, um, that creates some, some things that are difficult to respond to. But I would agree that by and large in the district, our real estate community is very, get, gets it uh, more, more than some of the citizenry. Although the citizenry is pretty sophisticated as well. well I, I think in, in the they, are, they aren't really greenfield projects, but like when you look at like New York Avenue, you know there wasn't a lot there. Um, that's been a really successful project. Columbia Heights was a bunch of empty lots. Mm -hmm. You know that's been. But that Buzzard Point. We open a metro station. That? Well, that's but that's what I'm saying. I mean, I think it's a public-private partnership. So, you know, I think the government comes with some investment, right? Which often leads like, hey, we're going to build a metro station here. There's a lot of stuff that happens with the developers, and you know, I think people sort of know how that works. But um, I think we've we've done a fairly good job. Last year was a real learning process for me um, working with with ULI because I didn't really know as much about that that world as I thought I did. And to uh, both of your points, actually, um, I found a couple things that were interesting. One is the developers had no interest in building as much parking. The problem was, which is a huge problem. And uh, the problem was what Sam brought up, which was which I was sort of poo-pooing in my own mind, but that Solinsky thing, right? Um, and the example you gave of uh, the 30 people at her bus stop. So here's the problem, right? You want as much involvement as possible. Unfortunately, that involvement has created a huge misunderstanding in places like Charleston, right? Like I, I was down there, I was advising the, the mayor on something, and they have this big uh, development on the waterfront and I was talking to the, the developers off off in a corner and they're like yeah they want us to build a parking space for every bedroom and that's gonna be 465 parking spaces we probably need like a hundred for the retail and all the units because nobody wants to buy the parking so the problem is the political establishment would thank you would hear from the public at the meetings you got to build parking because if you don't build parking, people are going to be parking on our streets, on our side streets. So it was the established people that lived in the adjoining neighborhood that said, you got to build the parking. So the politicians responded to that and said, okay, you have to build parking. Meanwhile, nobody understands that if you don't build the parking, people won't bring cars and you'll be better off for the most part. So basically all across the country, we have this huge misunderstanding between the politicians, the community members who think they know something, who control the process and don't. So you also need like strong political leadership. Um, you know, I've got a chance to work for two incredibly strong mayors in strong mayor uh, cities, and uh, you got some backbone. And I think in, the, in this regard, sorry, uh, you know, we, this region made a huge investment in mobility for 30, you know, 20 to 40 years ago, which is building out the metro rail system. We would never build that system in today's environment, and yet that is, I mean, Bike share is carrying 11,000 trips a day or something like that. Metro rail is carrying, what, 900,000, almost a million trips a day, something on that order. So w they're not really of the same scale that we're, that we're talking about. And, and some of that goes back, you know, Charleston doesn't have that transit system. Most cities don't have what we have in terms of being able to shape the city with a transportation investment, which I think would be very difficult to make today in today's fiscal environment nationwide. Um, is it Shyam? Yes, sir. Uh, I went to Jamie also. Go Dukes. Uh, <laughs> uh, mine is kind of kind of specific to your app. Uh, you, you said it's basically in college campuses right now, um, and we know that undergrads make some of the worst decisions possible. Do you find that they use <laughs> they they find it to use your your app for you know where it's live safe and maybe we're thinking of getting 
drunk kids a ride home that they may use it after they have committed one of those uh, bad acts themselves? And how quickly is that information able to transfer be transferred to the the, the police, the campus police, or any other public safety officials? I'm sorry, was your question around fraudulent reporting well, or fraudulent use? Fraudulent reporting, but how, how does your app then respond to you know crime? If 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 you figured out that someone has used your app, you know to be a, a part of that crime, how how quickly are you able to transform that information back to the public the public safety officials that? Sure. So the it. app is a real-time communication, so it allows people to quickly take a picture, video, notes, be anonymous, and share information with police. So it's real-time communication. There's a feedback loop so they can chat back and forth. Um, it's also a mass notification tool. So if there is an incident, they can publish it on the map and broadcast it out through Twitter, Facebook, text, email, let everyone know of the incident. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, but I'm saying what if, what if the, the incident is in, say it's not a mass Sure. And they use your app or your safe right app to then as the getaway car. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah you think like the criminal. I might do this. <laughs> no, I, I think most people, most criminals are hesitant to have a safety app on their phone and location services. So they're they're concerned in that sense. And because there's an immediate feedback loop and police are the ones responding, uh, people aren't very likely to uh, use the app in that sense. And then uh, most people think even if they have location off or, or they're anonymous, um, you, you can still trace a phone back, you know, smartphone. So people are very like unlikely to, to do that. Um, uh, but the safe ride as an instance, uh, you know, that students running it, you know, thankfully, you know, knock on wood, hopefully, you know, you were bringing up earlier that nothing bad happens, but safe rides are, are a program that exists all across the country. Um, so whether students abuse it or criminals abuse it using my app or not, they'll do that anyways. My technology is just making it easier to make that connection and, and communicate. Um, so I can't say that won't happen. Uh, I hope that it would never happen. Um, but I think there's enough data and location services and police being on the other end that would deter that. What's your, what's your uh, uh, idea, your app? Oh, I don't have oh, I thought you were working on something. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, is this working? Okay. Hi, my name is Nora. I'm a master's candidate here with Georgetown's Urban and Regional Planning Program. Thank you so much for this cutting edge discussion. I'm really interested in smart cities. It's a buzzword, but I also think it's just an incredibly exciting time to study urban planning. Um, and I noticed that um, your specialties and what you're most excited about in the smart city space is transportation. I'm curious about why transportation has been leading this um, this field of urban development. So that's my first question. And my second is a side note on equity. Um, we've talked a lot about public meetings or citizen input via smartphones. Some Most people have them. The penetration's high. But it's not 100%. So if we're talking about equity, um, are smartphones a requisite for full citizenship? If so, what does this mean for the district and citizen engagement in this new smart century? So uh, why Transpo? And then uh, what do we do about smartphones and citizenship? Thanks. Who wants to go first? Well, so let, let, let me, um, I can, I'll go first on the smartphones and citizenship. Uh, I don't know if I have a good answer for why transportation. Um, the, <laughs> but uh, the well, so so I think one challenge that we face is even if smartphone penetration, let's say, was 100%, everybody had a smartphone. Or I, I think we have an information problem where um, we have to figure out how we get information and engagement to people that are making the hour-long inefficient bus trip or something like that to be able to, you know, they, people may be doing that probably because that's what they've always done and not and because they don't even know what, uh, what other choices are out there. So just having a smartphone is a piece of it, but making sure we have, we, we sort of help people in the process of navigating that um, 
and that's like age and education and time and a whole bunch of different factors that go into whether people can actually access the information that is in their pocket on a daily basis. Uh, my, my sense for transportation is that it's something that everybody does and it's something that, that is um, sort of democratic in some way that ev everybody needs to travel and everybody um, and, and sort of needs to needs to make some of these choices and so that it's easier to to create things that get that uh, reach across platforms not everybody lives in the same neighborhood not everybody lives in an apartment not everybody you know grows their own food but um, but transportation everybody does and that's why we have 650,000 transportation experts in the district it grows to a million every day we have a million transportation experts every day traffic engineers, and they're all attorneys also. <laughs> um, but, but that's why I think transportation. Uh, well, on the smartphone to be a citizen thing, I mean, I get where you're going with that, but I think I would turn it back on, on you a little bit and say, like, is the public meeting really equity? I mean, is that, you know, because if you have two people out of a community of 50,000 come out, to complain about something and they drive the conversation. There's always a shrill minority in these meetings. There's always the one person that shows up that is gonna say the same thing every time. And if, that, if they drive the conversation, I, I think that's very inequitable. And, I, and so I think, like at DDOT, uh, I see Karen LeBlanc back there. She was the public information officer and really sort of the, the maven of marketing as well. And you know, we, um, we tried to put a new GUI interface on the front of the agency so that people could interact with it. So they could actually, like we built the, the DDOT, um, well we had the DDOT dish blog, we had the, uh, um, what was it, w the project portal so everybody could actually see the projects that we were working on and see the improvements made every week. And then we launched social media. Um, so, you know, people would complain at two in the morning about a pothole and somebody would respond to them. Now, is the, you know, 75-year-old, you know, white guy in Ward 3 going to be on a smartphone at 2 in the morning? No, maybe not. You know, maybe it's going to be the younger Latino or who knows, right? But you can't think about that. It, it's sort of like the transportation system. You've got to provide as many layers of options as possible. Streetcars, bike share, metro, walking safely, and then you've got to let people make their choices. And I think we now have so many more ways to reach people. You got to use all of them. You can't not do the old ones. You can do the old ones better, actually, with the new technology. Um, in terms of transportation, what was the question? Uh, why? Transportation. why do you oh, do this? because <laughs> anything that's really antiquated is ripe for disruption, and everybody driving around in their own car is extremely antiquated. You know, so um, that's got to change. It just doesn't work. Um, you know. Uh, Somebody was killed last night at 4th and H. There was a SUV. I was looking at the story earlier today. It was an SUV that uh, I thought skidded off on ice and ran onto the sidewalk and hit three people. And I, I've seen this when I was in Chicago all the time. And um, it turns out, I saw the updated story. They were on PCP. They were doing 60 miles an hour. They ran over three people, killed one of them. Um, you know, with technology, that won't happen anymore. Like, I really don't give a shit if you want to do PCP and kill yourself, fine. But, you know, if you're going to get behind the wheel of a car, then you should go to jail for the rest of your life. So, with autonomous cars, that's just not going to happen. Like, I don't want to worry about my daughter walking to school because some guy in PCP might run her over. And I want her to be able to freely walk to school. So, between, like, the LiveSafe app and Life360, which is a very interesting app, and autonomous cars, I actually think by the time she's eight, she will be able to walk around the city by herself. Um, Until the cars start I, I, I think on that note, you know, that's actually a really interesting note. I'd like everyone to respond or to, to, to also contribute. You know, what do you see happening in the next, you know, two, three years? Things are changing so rapidly, especially from a consumer perspective. So what, what are you working on or what do you see happening that you think is going to really accelerate this disruption? And uh, we just heard it from Gabe, so um, Ellen, um, well, Sam, and then Chai. Yeah, it's a, it's a non-technology thing. I mean, and this is something that we're very much working on at the downtown bid and through the Move DC process as well. It's reallocating road space. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, we allocate, going back to that parking theme again, we allocate so much of our road space for the storage of vehicles, and that's just nuts. And uh, we need to get away from that. And, and I think the development community is actually going to be one of the driving forces. On They understand real estate, and they understand that that roadway is the most priceless real estate the city has. And, and to use it for car storage, AKA parking, is nuts. So reallocating that space to the most efficient ways of moving people around, which would be bus transit or streetcar, bicycling, walking, um, while still making it possible for automobiles to have a space at the appropriate price that they create uh, the cost that they create for being a part of the system. So I think it's how we use the available rights of way. That's what's really going to have to change and will change in the next three to five years, okay. I believe, if Sam does his job the way we think he should. <laughs> Zero pressure. Sam? Uh, so I, I think that we'll finally get a little bit better handle on what um, data is actually telling us about how people are using, using streets and using uh, our transportation system. So we have sort of talking about being antiquated, we have, you know, our, our way of figuring out how people are using the transportation network has often been to just like put a tube across the street and count cars for 24 hours and, and then make inferences about what that means about where people are going and things like that. And we now have much more rich data. So we started putting in um, permanent bike counting stations. Like before that, we sort of we rely on this weird census question to tell us how many people are biking, or we rely on one person out for, you know, three days in a in a in May to count the same location every year, and that's interesting data points, but it's not really telling us about how people use the system. So, uh, and then you know the ability to to monitor people, things with sensors and cameras and stuff like that, um, we'll really start to understand better if we can organize ourselves as a, as a public transportation agency to, to know more about how people are using transportation and then inform those decisions in a much more uh, rich way. That's great. And should I? Um, yeah, just to go back to answer your question, I think transportation is leading because just as you mentioned, it's a high touch. Everyone's doing it every day. So if you make changes there, the impact is very visible. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's other places that are ripe for innovation too. Safety and security is another place that's antiquated. You know, the blue lights on campuses are still being bought, but they're antiques. You have a smartphone in your pocket. So I think mm -hmm. I think where things are headed is is things are headed mobile. Um, you know, PCP is a big issue in DC. That I mean, that needs to get resolved. Uh, I mean, that's a huge issue. Um, apps like Nextdoor.com, where it's in create creating community to share with each other and communicate with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. It's a very popular service. I live in Chevy Chase, DC now. I moved away from Capitol Hill after my experience. Uh, and uh, people are posting all kinds of things and people are meeting each other and sharing information and feeling safer it's creating peace of mind mm -hmm. uh, the 311 app you know reporting a pothole or a graffiti mm -hmm. you get you get stars you get you know you become elected mayor within the app I mean that's <laughs> a, it's incredible the amount of stuff that mm -hmm. single people have fixed around the city and they're mm -hmm. sharing it inspiring other people to do it um, and then live safe but you know I think apps is, is in technology and mobile is really where the one person who comes to the committee meeting who's saying the same thing and, and, and is crazy, that voice should not get heard. It should be all mm -hmm. the whole community here that's participating. Mm -hmm. And mobile allows you to do that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's definitely obvious, something that's hitting us in our, in our faces. Great. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Oh. This is great. Thank you so much. And um, we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next event. We're going to explore the lodging industry and how that's being disrupted. Thank you very much.